to the ends of the Earth. Journey to the center of the Earth, adapted from the Jules Verne novel by Moya O'Shea, episode one. What I'm about to tell you, I cannot expect you to believe, for some people will believe nothing against the testimony of their own experience. For the purposes of clarity, I must take you back to the 24th of May, 1863, when my uncle, Professor Liedenbrook, rushed into his little house, number 19 Königstrasse, one of the oldest streets in the oldest portion of the city of Hamburg. Axel! Axel! The house where he lived with me, his nephew Axel, his goddaughter and ward from Veerland, Groiben, and our servant, Martha. Oh, it says here, Martha, the new zoological gardens are something of a success. We thought we would... <gasps> Professor Lindbrook, back so soon? And the dinner not ready? Oh, uh, Mr. Axel, I will run and hide myself while you argue with him. Axel! Uh, perhaps I will hide too. Ah, Axel. Uh, uh, Uncle Lindbrook. In my study, now. Uh, but, Uncle, I... I, I well, was... Not come yet! On my way! A geologist with the keen eye of a mineralogist, Otto Liebenbrook was professor at the Johanneum and was also the curator of the Museum of Mineralogy. Wait till you see what priceless treasure I found while rummaging in the shop of Hevelin the Jew. Uh, a remarkable book. Uh, did you ever see such a binding? And after 700 years. Oh, magnificent. And the title of this marvellous work? Uh, this work? This work is the Heimstringler of Snorri Sturluson. Snorri Sturluson? Really, Uncle, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. Just now, I, I was busy... The most thinking... famous Icelandic author of the 12th century. It is the chronicle of the Norwegian princes who ruled Iceland. You don't say. Of course, it's a translation. What shall I do with the translation? This is the Icelandic original. In the magnificent idiomatic vernacular. A runic manuscript. Runic? Uh, do you want me to explain what that is? Of course not. I know what runic is. Runic characters were used in Iceland in former ages. They were invented, it is said, by Odin himself. Now look there, huh? And wonder, impious young man, huh? And admire these letters. Uncle, what's this? Something caught between the pages. Where? Oh. Oh, oh, you've dropped it. Uh, I have it. It looks to be a strip of parchment. <sighs> Do you think it was hidden inside? I shouldn't think so. Yeah, it has something written on it. L let me see. Some sort of mysterious characters. Axel, what on earth is their meaning? They're most certainly old Icelandic, like the book that, that this, this, we, we must try to discover for. Professor Liedenbrook, dinner won't be too long. Oh, infernal woman. Take your soup and go where it will boil away to nothing. I, I'm sorry, Professor Liedenbrook. I... Poor Martha. I will go and eat. That. You will not, and sit there. But, Uncle, I am hungry. Sit there and write. Oh. We must work out what this means. Here, I will dictate to you every letter of our alphabet which corresponds to each of those characters. Now, take care you make no mistake. I will try my best, Uncle. I know my runic alphabet well enough to be sure this first character translates as a double M. Double M. Mm -hmm. Then we have a full stop. Full stop. Yes, an R. R. N. N. L. 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 S. S. And the next word is uh, E. E. S. S. R. R. Uh, Axel. This is a cryptogram or cipher in which the letters are purposely thrown in confusion, I would guess, but when properly arranged, reveal their sense. It is a hidden message. Indeed. I am led to imagine that some possessor of this book wrote these characters. Perhaps his name is to be found somewhere inside. Yeah, well, um... Nothing discernible. Well, pass me my lens, Axel. Well, here, Uncle Liedenbrook. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I can just make out... Arne Sarknesum. Who? Why, it is the name of another Icelander, a savant of the 16th century, a celebrated alchemist and the possessor of the book. Uh, well done, Uncle. So what is this Sarkness and concealed in his cryptogram, hmm? I will neither sleep nor eat until I find out, and nor will you, Axel. Oh. First of all, we must find the key to this cipher, the way to unlock its meaning. Uh. But here, I must confess, my mind wandered, and for very good reason. 
as my eyes had fallen upon a charming painting of Groiben, who was at this time at Altona staying with a relation. And in her absence, I was very downhearted, for the pretty Vierlandes and the professor's nephew loved each other with a patience and a calmness entirely German. What are you looking at, my boy? Ah, uh, you're in love with Groiben? Yes. No. Do you love Groy, but now, although the characters on the parchment are runic, this Sarknusum was a very well-informed man, and I would guess he would naturally select that language which was currently adopted by the choice spirits of the 16th century. You think century. the message is in Latin? Yes, I, I do, and I'm going to try something. I'm going to take the first letter of each word, then the second, then the third, and so on, and see if that spells something. I'm going to take this down. Double M. E. These letters named one at a time made no sense to me at all. I therefore waited for the professor to unfold, with great pomp, the magnificent hidden Latin of this mysterious phrase. Oh, it doesn't make any sense! The Latin is confused! The codes are muddled! Oh, uh, I need air! He's gone. Completely gone. But how about his dinner? He won't have any. What? No, my dear Martha, he won't eat a thing. Uncle Liedenbrook is going to make us all fast until he has succeeded in deciphering an indecipherable scrawl. Oh, my dear! Must we all die of hunger? As Uncle Liedenbrook's laboratory assistant, I tried to fill in time classifying a collection of silicious nodules we'd been sent. Oh, it is warm here. Yeah. I began to fan myself with the closest thing to hand, that infernal piece of paper on which I'd been made to write my uncle's translation of runic characters into Latin. Roy Ben, look at you watching me. How I wish I could rush to you and tell you all about it. You... The back and front successively passing before my eyes. What's this? Craterum terrestri. Latin. Latin. Can you imagine my surprise when in one of those rapid revolutions, at the moment when the back was turned to me, I caught sight of some words. Oh my goodness, that's it. One just had to read the letters backwards. D do you see, my darling Groiben? I have discovered the key to the cipher. Now, let us see what it really says. In Snifel's Joculus, Craterum Chem de Libe... Um... What? Has this really been done? A mortal man has had the audacity to penetrate. My uncle shall never know it. He would insist upon doing it too, and would take me with him, and we should never get back. Uh, Groibin, we would never see each other again. I, I must destroy this dangerous secret. Uh, the, the, the fire. I will throw it in the fire. Groibin, watch as I throw Axel. it. Axel! Uh, I've been uh, walking, Axel, along the river by the canal and have a uh, new combination. I will crack this yet. Hand me the parchment. I, uh, oh, very well. Uh, for hours, Uncle Liedenbrook worked on. What is that, Uncle? An algebraic for me? Mm. Oh. No, no, that's not it. The next morning, the indefatigable worker was still at his post. No, no. But I resolved to keep quiet, for he would insist upon going. Nothing on earth could stop him. However, by three o'clock that afternoon, after no breakfast, no dinner, no supper the night before, which hardly suited the constitution of a hungry, growing lad such as myself. Uncle. Ah, so, uh, the very first idea which would come into anyone's head to, to confuse the letters of a sentence would, would be to write the words Uncle vertically. Uncle Yeah? There. Read that. My translation. Look, you've established there's nothing Not to do Not you read from the end to the beginning. End to be... In, in Snifel's Joculus... Uh, uh, <laughs> clever, Sarknesum! You have written your sentence backwards! <laughs> in, in Snifel's Joculus, Cratrum chem de libat umbra scutaris, duly... Oh, this really is quite appalling Latin. <laughs> but the meaning, Uncle. Uh, descend, bold traveller, into the crater of the Jokul of Snifel, which the shadow of Scataris touches before the calends of July, and you will attain the... the centre of the earth, which I, Arna Sarknesem, have done. Jokul, 
Snifle. What is this Scataris? Hmm. Axel, take down the third atlas on the second shelf in the large bookcase. Series Z, plate four. As requested. Uh, I hear is one of the best maps of Iceland, that of Henderson. I follow my finger from Reykjavik, the capital. Uh, what do you see there? Um, a mountain rising out of the sea. That is Snifle. It is a mountain 5,000 feet high and an extinct volcano, which last erupted in 1219, and one of the most remarkable if its crater leads down into the centre of the Earth. Hopefully, it is a term applied to all eruptive mountains in Iceland. Uh, Skataris. Uh, Skataris, I mean, let me think. Um, Snifel has several craters. It was therefore necessary to point out which of these leads to the centre of the Earth. Uncle, none of them will lead to the centre. must have observed that at the approach of the calends of July, that is to say the last days of June, one of the, the peaks, Skataris. Skataris, flings its shadow down the mouth of that particular crater. <laughs> Could there possibly have been a more exact guide? <laughs> what time is it? Yeah. Three o'clock. Is it really? Past dinner and I'm half dead with hunger. Come on. And after dinner? After. After dinner? Pack my trunk. What? And yours. Ah. Uh. With these words, a cold shiver ran through me. I ran out of my uncle's study. Good afternoon, sir. Some bread for your supper, freshly baked. Oh, goodness, yes. Give me a loaf. Finest bread in all of Hamburg, sir. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you are hungry. <laughs> and as if there was not air enough in all the streets in Hamburg to put me right again, I made for the banks of the Elbe, which I followed until I reached the Altona Road. Groiben! Groiben! And espied my little Groiben, bravely returning with her light step to Hamburg. Oh, my darling Groiben. Oh, what is the matter? In a couple of minutes, my pretty Vielandes was fully informed of the dreadful situation. Well, that will be a splendid journey. Not you too. Yes, Axel. A journey worthy of the nephew of a genius. It is a good thing for a man to be distinguished by some great enterprise. Won't you dissuade me from such an undertaking? I will not, my dear Axel. And I would willingly go with you, but I would only be in your way. Ah, oh, women and young girls. How incomprehensible are your feminine hearts? It was night when we arrived back at the house in Koenigstrasse, where the front hall was encumbered with rope ladders, knotted cords, torches, flasks, grappling irons, alpenstocks, pickaxes, iron shod sticks, enough to load ten men. All afternoon, the philosophical instrument makers and the electricians had been coming and going. What on earth is... Father, the parlour. Oh. Take them through to the parlour. The parlour is full. Axel, you miserable wretch. Oh, hello, Groiben. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, don't you remember? I went to stay Axel, with... Axel, your boxes are not packed and my papers are not arranged. Oh. And where's the key to my carpet bag? We leave tomorrow. But what need is there to hurry? Time. Time flying with irreparable rapidity. Oh. Do you think we can get to Iceland in a couple of days? If we delay, we'll be too late to see the shadow of Skataris touch the crater of Snifel. I go and pack. There was no reply to this. And I went up to my room and began to pack what I guessed one might need for a journey to the centre of the earth. <clears throat> Axel? May I come in, please? Groivel. I have had a talk with my guardian. He is a bold philosopher, a man of immense courage, and you must remember that his blood flows in your veins. Hmm. He has confided to me his plans, his hopes, and how he expects to succeed. Oh, my dear Axel, what honour will fall upon Professor Liedenbrook and so be reflected upon his companion? When you return, you will be a man, his equal free to speak and to act independently uh, and free to... Marry me. <laughs> <laughs> my dear one. <laughs> At ten o'clock I fell upon my bed, a lump of inert matter. All through the night, terror had hold of me. I spent it dreaming of abysses. I awoke the next morning with shattered nerves and washed and dressed, trembling and weary and... Headed downstairs with my portmanteau. 
Take this out and come back. Ah, here he comes now. Ah, your case, Axel? It's packed. Good morning, Groven. Good morning, Axel. Then make haste or we shall miss the train. Let me take that for you, sir. I'll we'll find room for it somewhere. Very good. How fine you look, my dear Axel. A night's rest has done you good. A night's rest? <laughs> uh, Groven, I leave you in charge whilst we're away. It's certainly. You have explained everything most fully. Farewell, my dear. Goodbye. I will miss you. And remember silence upon the whole subject and let no one get to the center of the earth before us i understand martha goodbye and i can depend on you as always goodbye martha why don't you go sir Groven. go my dear axel go i am now your fiance and when you come back i will be your wife farewell my pretty violent days <laughs> What can I say? Our journey had commenced. Was I resigned to it? Oh, no. No, no, not yet. We travelled by train to Kiel to catch a steamboat to Corsa, a small town on the west coast of Zealand, where we would transfer to another train which would take us to Copenhagen. We had only just set foot in that city and had settled into our hotel when my uncle dragged me out to visit the Keys with the object of finding the next vessel to sail. I was yet in hopes there would be no means of getting to Iceland. We sail the 2nd of June. Andy Valkyrie has two berths spare. The last two, sir. Oh, hooray. Marvellous, just marvellous. How fortunate we are to have found this boat ready for sailing, Axel. How fortunate beyond words. Uh, come, Axel. We have somewhere to be. Uh, uncle? And that somewhere to be was a certain church situated on the island of Amak. The Vorfrelsus Kirga. An unremarkable house of worship, I would say, Uncle. But the spire, dear boy, the spire. Oh. Do you not see the external staircase, which circles all the way around and around and around? Oh, now you've drawn my attention to it. Let us get to the top. Uh, on that staircase? It, it will make me dizzy. The more reason we should go up. We must get used to such heights. Uh, if you say so. After toiling up 150 steps inside the church, fresh air hit my face and we were on the leads of the tower where the aerial staircase began its gyrations, only guarded by a thin iron rail. Uh, climb, boy. Climb. I'm trying. Uh, not on your stomach, Axel. Oh, the knees were bad enough. The spire uh, rocks with every gust of wind. I'm too dizzy to stand or kneel. Axel! I'm coming, Uncle. Uh, 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 am I at the top? Oh. Open your eyes. Uh, and you will see. Uh, oh, Adam, oh, open them. Oh, Look down. Oh, you must take a lesson oh, in our business. Open your eyes. Oh, oh the steep is spinning. Oh, spinning. Uh, the houses below squashed flat. My first lesson in vertigo lasted an hour. Tomorrow. We will do it uh, again. What? Oh. And so it was. For five days, I was obliged to undergo this anti-vertiginous exercise until the day of our departure on the Valkyrie. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the passage will, will take, uh, Captain Bayana? Uh, ten days. Oh. We don't need an Orvester in passing the fells. Ah, uh, but, but you're not, uh, as a rule, subject to considerable delays? Professor Liedenborg, don't be uneasy. We shall get there in very good time. Oh. The passage was marked by nothing unusual. I bore the troubles of the sea pretty well. My uncle, to his own disgust and his greater shame, was ill all during the voyage. Oh, oh Axel. Oh. Oh. There, there, Uncle Liedenborg. Oh. Oh. And on schedule, the Valkyrie dropped her anchor before Reykjavik in Fox Bay. There it is. There's your mountain. Snifle. Snifle! Where? There. North of the bay. See the double peak. So that is Snifle. During our brief time in the Icelandic capital, we visited the local library, where we found out more about Arnus Sarknesum, whose message on that piece of parchment had caused us to embark on this confounded expedition. Ah, my good woman. Now, I wish to know if a month... 
You obviously do not speak Icelandic, otherwise you would see the sign asks for quiet. Uh, as you wish. I wish to know if amongst your ancient books you possess any of the works of Arna Sarknesum. Arna Sarknesum? You mean the learned 16th century savant, naturalist, chemist and traveller? Yes. His works, we do not have them. What, well, not in Iceland? They are neither in Iceland nor anywhere else because Arna Sarknesum was persecuted for heresy. And in 1573, his books were burned by the common hangman. Very good. Excellent. What? Excellent. Yes, yes. Now it is all clear. Now it is all untangled. I see why Sarknesum, placed on the Index Expurgatorius and compelled to hide the discoveries made by his genius, was obliged to bury in an incomprehensible cryptogram the secret what of... What secret? Have you some private document on your possession? Uncle, look at the time. We have to see about a guide. Come, come. A uh, guide, yes, I'd almost forgot. Yes, we must go. What secret? As the next part of our expedition would be by land only, above and below it, we engaged a guide who came highly recommended. Axel, I would like you to meet Hans Bielke. <laughs> a tall man of robust build, strong and intelligent. His whole appearance bespoke a perfect calmness, which nothing in the world could astonish or disturb. How do you do, Mr. Bielka? Uh, uh, Axel, Hans does not speak one word of our language. Not one. A nephew, you know I'm not prone to exaggeration. His language is Icelandic, but he can get by in Danish. And, being something of a polyglot, so can I. Uh, Hans, de her er min nuvo Axel Liedenbrook. Ah. Wacht de murder, Axel. Hans says, how do you do? Uh, call him Hans. Yeah, yeah, Hans. Uh, how do you do, Hans? Hans is a hunter by trade. A hunter of the Ida duck. Oh. <laughs> he does not look like the type who is likely to frighten game or even get near it. <laughs> Have no fear. He only hunts the feathers, not the duck, eh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hans was engaged for the whole period of my uncle's scientific research for the remuneration of three rix dollars a week, about 12 shillings. Hans is a first-rate fellow, Axel, but he little thinks of the marvellous part he has to play in the future. So he is to go with us as far as... The centre of the earth, Axel. Hmm, but it was an express article of the Covenant that his wages should be counted out to him every Saturday at six o'clock in the evening. Well, Lord, I'll have to in sex. Time being against us, we left Reykjavik immediately. It was already the 16th of June, and headed to the village of Starpi on the south shore of the Snifel Peninsula, at the very foot of the volcano. A journey of seven or eight days. There stands the giant I shall conquer. Yeah, the dear air snipe is sugar. Yeah, Hans, yeah. Uh, Uncle Liedenbrook, I was thinking there's no proof Snifel is extinct. Who can assure us an eruption is not brewing at this very moment? Does it follow that because the monster has slept since 1219, he must never wake again? And if he wakes up presently, where will we be? Yes, I was thinking that too. You were? Uh, but you see all those volumes of steam, Axel, there and there, curling up into the air, are what the Icelanders call, uh, Yeah, yeah, dear Uh Issuing from thermal springs, now they demonstrate we have nothing to fear from the fury of a volcanic explosion. Am I to believe that? In Starpi, Hans hired the services of three Icelanders to do their duty in the transport of the burdens, and who were to turn back as soon as we arrived at the crater. Along with our provisions and instruments, Hans, who was a cautious man, added to our luggage a leather bottle full of water, which with our flasks would ensure us a supply for eight days. Snifel is 5,000 feet high, and the ascent was arduous, the cold excessively keen. The wind lashed pumice and sand and dust onto the side of the cone to which we were holding. But it was at 11 on a sunlit night. The summit was reached, and I had time to observe the midnight sun at his lowest point, gilding with his pale rays the island that slept beneath my feet. Here we are, oh. Axel, oh. at the top of Snyfell. Uh. And here are two peaks. Uh. Hans will tell us the name of the one we're on. 
Hans, uh, yeah. what is the uh, Dana Beer Club? Den uh, Herr Skatais. Skataris. Did you hear that? Descend, bold traveller, into the crater of the Yerkel of Snifel, which the shadow of Skataris touches before the calends of July, and you will attain the center of the earth. Now, for the crater. The crater of Snifel resembled an inverted cone, the opening of which might be half a league in diameter. Its depth appeared to be about 2,000 feet. Uh, Uncle, please. In the morning, supper, sleep. Now! Time is against us. The calendar of July. You heard a tear that would have fallen across the terror, Hans. Yeah. So am I. You heard You too, Hans. In order to facilitate the descent, Hans wound his way down the cone by a spiral path, followed by the Icelanders, Uncle Liedenbrook, and myself. <coughs> At particularly dubious passages, we were obliged to connect ourselves with one another by a long rope, in order that any man who missed his footing might be held up by his companions. Hours later, we arrived. Uh, we are here now. So, bottom of the crater at last. And I raised my head and saw straight above me the upper aperture of the cone, framing a bit of sky very small in circumference. Just on the edge appeared the snowy peak of Skataris. We gave our thanks to the Icelanders. Goodbye. Safe journey back. Uh, thank you for your help. Uh, 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 and turned our attention to three chimneys through which, in its eruptions, Snifel had driven forth fire and lava from its central furnace. Each of these chimneys was around 100 feet in diameter and gaped before us right in our path. Which one, Axel? Which one will lead us to the center of the earth? I can hardly bear to look into any of them, Uncle. Let alone contemplate the thought of descending into one. Which? Which? Did man it was it? I don't think I... Ha! What's this? Uh, Uncle? Axel! Axel, come! Come! What? Had a fun in What, what oh. Uncle? Look. Scratched on this rock. Uh, Hans, see her. Runic characters. Oh no, this thrice accursed name. Arno Sarkinsum. Do you yet doubt? What could I say? Here was crushing evidence. Of the three ways open before us, one had been taken by Sarkinsum. The indications of the learned Icelander, hinted at in the cryptogram, pointed to the fact the shadow of Skataris came to touch that particular way during the latter days of the month of June. The peak acting like a giant sundial which on a certain day would point out the road to the center of the earth. Accursed clouds! Go! Go away! But now, no sun, no shadow, and therefore no indication. Here was the 25th of June. If the sun was clouded for six days, we must postpone our visit till next year. I could only hope. No, no! Not next year! On the 26th of June, there was still nothing. Rain mingled with snow fell all day long. Oh, no. Why rain? Why now? It's summer! And I felt a malicious pleasure in watching the thousand rills and cascades that came tumbling down the sides of the cone. And the next day was again overcast. Oh, I don't believe this! Hands the air do right for it! And so nearby. But on the 28th of June, the last but two days of the month, with the oh. change of the moon came a change of weather. No, son. Go away. Please, go. What did you say, Axel? Uh, son, uh, it is coming out. And the sun poured a flood of light down the crater. Hooray! <laughs> oh, Axel, did you ever see a more welcome light? Since you asked. The sun! Yeah. The sun! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, Hans, the sun. I say, Sulen. Yeah, Sulen. And with that... Skataris laid down his sharp pointed angular shadow which began to move in the opposite direction to that radiant orb. There it is. There it is. And at noon, being at its least extent, 
It came and softly fell upon the edge of... The middle chimney. It's the middle way. A little yarns in the rock, you know? Yeah. As I feared. No till yarns in the can. Farmer! Forward! The center of the earth. I had not yet ventured to look down into the bottomless pit into which I was about to plunge. I might now either share in the enterprise or refuse to go. Yes. That's it. I could refuse to go. But I was ashamed to recoil in the calm, indifferent presence of the Eiderdown hunter. My heart flew back to my sweet Vilon days. For you, darling Groyburn, I do this. And I approached the central chimney. Oh, it's so dark. Oh, so deep. Four. Oh, thank you, Hans. Oh, dizzy. Oh, so dizzy. I, I suppose I did not take as many lessons in heights on the steeple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Axel? I'm all right, Uncle. But I looked down there. And the walls are almost perpendicular. A, a rope fastened to the edge of the aperture might help us down. But how are we to unfasten it when arrived at the end? Uh, now, I see here, Axel. Uh, this coil of rope is 400 feet long. Now, I drop down half and uh, pass the rest around this lava block. Yep. Uh, yep. Like so. Uh, uh, I can't. It should, uh, should hold fast. Then, throw the other half down. Uh, each of us can then descend by holding both halves of the rope, which would not be able to unroll itself from its hold. Uh, when 200 feet down, it, it will be easy to get possession of the whole of the rope by letting go one end and pulling down the other. Uh, this exercise can go on ad infinitum. Ad infinitum? <laughs> good idea, Hans. Uh, good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My good idea. Uh, yeah, but what about our things? Uh, uh, well, I will divide them into three lots. Each of us will strap one on his back. I, I mean only fragile articles. Hans will take charge of the tools and a portion of the provisions. You, Axel, will take another third of the provisions and the arms. I will take the rest of the provisions and the, uh, and the delicate instruments. Yeah, but the clothes and, and, and that mass of ladders and ropes, what is to become of them. Aha. Watch. Uh, help me, Hans. Uh, uh, hands are yelled, my Yep. Oh, oh, my goodness. Ah. Ah. See, <laughs> they can go down by themselves. <laughs> but, but I didn't hear them hit the bottom. Not a sound. It took half an hour for all three of us to descend 200 feet. And this process would be repeated a total of 14 times before we would be reunited with our belongings. Ah. Ah. Oh, tell me there's no further. Uh, there's a, a sort of passage which inclines to the right. Oh. Oh. We'll, we'll see about that tomorrow. Let us have supper and go to sleep. The darkness was not yet complete. And later, after a meal of essence of beef and biscuits, water and a little gin, I lay on my bed of stones and lava fragments and saw a bright, sparkling point of light at the extremity of the gigantic tube. It was a star. At eight in the morning, a ray of daylight came to wake us. Yes, Hans, I think we all slept well. And the thousand shining surfaces of the lava walls received it on its passage and scattered it like a shower of sparks as we quickly breakfasted and made ready for the day ahead. Well, Axel, what do you say to it, hmm? Did you ever spend a quieter night on a little house in Königstrasse? <laughs> no doubt it is very quiet at the bottom of this well. There's something quite alarming in the quietness. <laughs> if you're frightened already, what will you be by and by? We've not got a single inch yet into the bowels of the earth. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, we've only reached the level of the island. This long vertical tube, which terminated at the mouth of the crater, has its lower end only at the level of the sea. Are you sure of that? Quite sure. I consult the barometer. Oh. Now, Axel, now we are really going into the interior of the earth. Oh. At this precise moment, the journey really commences. Only now? Hands new for a side horizon. 
Ja, ja, så siger vi det. Har du ikke så godt, jeg så Each shouldered his package, and hands would drive before him the bundle of cords and clothes, which, owing to the downward slope, would slide at the end of a long rope. I shall light the way. Around my uncle's neck hung a Rumkoff's apparatus, a type of lamp, which he lit. Ah, you see how the apparatus forms an electric communication with the coil in the lantern. Ah. Ah! <laughs> Let there be light. I have to admit, it is remarkable. And the sufficiently bright light dispersed the darkness of the passage. Hans carried another apparatus, yeah. uh, which was also put into action. And this ingenious application of electricity would enable us to go on for a long time by creating an artificial light, even in the midst of the most flammable gases. Now, march! I raised my head and saw for the last time, through the length of that vast tube, the sky of Iceland, which I was never to behold again. Farewell, friend. March, Axel! Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Uncle, you should have said slide. Oh, oh. Safety, no, why in style? Uh, yes, uh, the way is, is steep. Uh, 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 look! Oh, my boy. Look. Oh. Oh, it is magnificent. My uncle, what a sight. Uh, ah, the lava has formed a, a surface of crystals. Uh, how can I describe it? Like limpid tears of glass making globes of light. And the blending hues of the lava. Browns, reds, and yellows. <laughs> uh, well, you uh, will see greater splendors than these, I hope. Come. As we trekked, there was no sensible change in temperature, which gave reason to the belief our descent was more horizontal than vertical. For it was known the earth was a furnace at its center, although my uncle did not agree with this notion. As for the exact depth reached, he measured accurately the angles of deviation and inclination on the road, but he kept the results to himself. We walked until we could walk no more. Uh, this cavern will suit as well for the night. Whoosh. And there is plenty of air. We'll light the torches and get settled. How is there air, Uncle? Uh, Although after seven consecutive hours of descent, I'm too tired to care. Yeah, I saw a for after mine. A mango tag, Hans. And thirsty. Mm. Although. Perhaps I should not drink so much. Are you surprised by the lack of springs? Don't be uneasy. We shall find more than we want. When? We've already half drunk our supply. When we've left this bed of lava behind us, how could springs break through such walls as these? Hmm? Perhaps you're interested in our arrangements for sleeping. They were very simple. A railway rug each, into which we rolled ourselves, was our sole covering. We had neither cold nor intrusive visits to fear as we enjoyed absolute safety and utter seclusion. No savages or wild beasts infected these silent depths. Next day, Tuesday the 30th of June at 6 a.m., the descent began again, following the tunnel of lava along a real natural staircase. Fine, Hey, the hands, go for stop it, do. Yeah, it's two way, valley, madam. We can end skill tour. Uncle? Ah, uh, here we are at the very end of the chimney. Uh, there is an intersection. Oh, I see. We have one going east, one west. But, but which way? Uh, east. Come. Okay, so see you, dear. Uncle, uh, are you sure? This way. The slope of this tunnel was barely perceptible and its sections unequal. Sometimes we passed a series of arches succeeding each other like the majestic arcades of a Gothic cathedral. A mile further, we had to bow our heads under the corniced elliptic arches in the Romanesque style. In other places, this magnificence gave way to narrow channels we had to creep along. It was the next day when I noticed something. We are going up. Going up. And have been for some time now. This road is bringing us nearer to the surface with every step. Croydon. And, and look here. The, the lava coating is giving way to rock, 
We are passing through rocks of the transition or Silurian system. What's that you say? This series of sandstones, limestones, even the first indications of slate. We are at the period when the first plants and animals appeared. Oh. Are we stopping who? I just gotta go. That late, Hans. But, Uncle, we have left the lava path, and this road could not possibly lead to the extinct furnace of Snifel. If I am right, then we must soon find some fossil remains of primitive life, and we must yield to the evidence. I will search. I'm sure I'm not mistaken. There must be... Uh, what's this? Uncle, wait. What? If I knew. Look what I found. Oh, very well. Uh, it is the shell of a crustacean of an extinct species called a trilobite, nothing more. But don't you conclude... That's what you conclude yourself. Yes, I do, perfectly. We have left the granite and the lava. It is possible that I, I may be a... Mistaken, and should have taken the west path and not the east. But I cannot be sure until I have reached the very end of this tunnel where I await one of two events. Either the appearance of a vertical well down which our descent might be resumed, or that of some obstacle. You are right in doing this, Uncle, and I should quite approve of your determination if we were not threatened with a danger growing ever nearer. What danger? Well, the want of water. Well, Axel, we will put ourselves on rations. And this, indeed, we were forced to do. Oh. Our provision of water could not last more than three days, and to our sorrow, we had little reason to expect a spring in these transition beds. For two days we walked, and I observed a singular deadening of the reflection of our lamps from the side walls. Marble, schist, the limestone and sandstone were giving way to a dark and lustreless lining. It was cold. And, Uncle, I'm beginning to think this tunnel must be endless. Well, it isn't. Is it Mark? Endless. How do you figure that? We you know it will end. Because we are at the end. A dead end. Oh. Well, now, at any rate, we shall know what we're about. We are not on Sarknesum's road. Uh, and and all, all we have to do is, is, is go back. Uh, let us take a night's rest. Uh, and in three days, we shall get to the fork in the road. Three days? By tomorrow, we will have no water. Nor courage either, Axel. Courage? As I had foretold, the water failed entirely the next day. Oh, oh for hell, will you do for stack? Yeah, drink, Professor Liedenbrock. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, uh, let us hope that it is in some way helping. Uh, your turn, my dear boy. Take a sip of gin. Oh. Uh, this infernal liquid burns my throat. I'm too dry, and the air in here is stifling. Fatigue has paralyzed my limbs. And yeah, we believe her not till Ella help her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for really. Come, Axel. We will help you. But, Come. But you are too tired, oh. too tortured with thirst yourself. No, no, no. Uh, <coughs> Axel, if you... uh, quiet, yeah, boy. If you had uh, enough. <coughs> yes, you had oh, it. Hold on to me. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Uh, Go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, At last, on Tuesday the 7th of July, we arrived on our hands and knees back at the junction of the two roads. Uh, 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 lift, Hans, lift. Come, Axel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor boy. Drink. No more gin. Draught of water. But it is the very last. Yeah, the last. Drink. <coughs> I kept it as a precious treasure at the bottom of my flask. Uh, Twenty times, nay, a hundred times, I have fought against a frightful impulse to drink it. My dear uncle, thank you. Thank you. We have no water. We must return. Return. <coughs> so then, Axel. 
You have found no courage or energy in these few drops of water. I see you just as feeble-minded as you were before, and still only expressing despair. What? You won't go back? Should I renounce this expedition? <coughs> just when we have the fairest chance of success? Never! Then we must resign ourselves to destruction. No, Axel, no. Go back. Hans will go with you. Huh? Leave me. Leave you here? I have undertaken this journey. I will carry it out to the end. And I will not return. Hans, he, he, he is not the master of our life. We must fly. We must drag him back. Do you understand? Come, You will get nothing from that immovable servant. The want of water is the only obstacle in our way. Perhaps we will be more fortunate if we follow the, the western tunnel. As it appears to penetrate downwards, it should bring us to granite rocks. There we must meet with abundant springs. The, the, the nature of the rock assures me of this. This, this is my proposal. <clears throat> if in a single day we have not met with the water that we want, I swear to you, we will return to the surface of the earth. <coughs> Let us start. <laughs> I am the Columbus of the netherworld. <laughs> <laughs> this time the descent commenced by the new tunnel, and despite the appearance of subsequent walls of granite, no signs of water appeared. My limbs are failing. Oh, the pain. It hurts us all. Come to me. I'm dying. I saw it. It's over. We're finished. We can never make it back now. Never to see my Groypen again. My pretty Bill Tess. Hush now, Axel. Close your eyes. Let death take you. Shh. Where will you go after? But can't hear something. I do too. I, I can't hear. Van. 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 Axel. It's water. Van. See her. Here, Van! It's a torrent. There'd be no doubt. A subterranean river is flowing around us. Behind this wall of granite. We're safe. Yes. Hans is right. Capital fellow. His pickaxe will do the trick. Who would have thought of it? Yes. Who but Hans? Such an expedient, however simple, would never have entered my mind or that of my uncle. I tried not to think that the blow of a pickaxe in this part of the Earth's structure might cause some displacement which would crush us all. It is taking too long. We cannot wait. I will, I will help too. Where's my pickaxe? Ah, here. Stand back, Hans. Let, let, let me have a go. Hasma. Ah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. One. Two. The water is boiling. I'm blinded by steam. I let it cool, boy. It's water. We waited for as long as humanly possible, and though still warm, soon had the satisfaction of swallowing our first draft. Why, this is a Calibian spring. It's delicious. What a capital source of strength Hans has found for us. We'll call it after him. Hans, agreed. We are of cult killing after die some tack. Hans. Susan Tag. <laughs> Hands back. Should we try to stop up the hole, Uncle? Yeah, we'll let it run on. 
We'll flow down and we'll both guide and refresh us. That is well planned. With this stream for our guide, there is no reason why we should not succeed in our undertaking. Oh, uh -huh, my boy! You agree with me now? I agree with you most heartily. Have any man in new hands? Any any man in new By the next day, we had forgotten all our sufferings. I felt wonderfully stronger and quite decided upon pushing on. Why should not so firmly convinced a man as my uncle, furnished with so industrious a guide as Hans and accompanied by so determined a nephew as myself, go on to final success? If it had been proposed to me to return to the summit of Snifel, I should have indignantly refused. The granite here forms something of a labyrinth. It is certainly a comfort to have the hands back at our feet. The way is still too horizontal. According to my calculations, we must be 30 leagues southwest of Reykjavik and at a depth of two leagues and a half. Then if we... Oh, 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 I didn't see it. <laughs> I nearly fell in. Oh, it is just as I would have wished for. A huge abyss of, say, uh, how large would you say it is, Axel? I nearly fell in. What geologists call a fault. Now, this will take us a long way down and without much difficulty. For the projections in the rock form quite a staircase. Fasten the ropes, Hans. What? Uh, Hans, uh, Raven. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got so, Professor Liebenborg. For three or so days, we climbed down this vault. And every hour, my uncle noted the indications of the compass, the chronometer, the manometer, and the thermometer. Therefore, it was not difficult to know our whereabouts exactly. I was reflecting that if your calculations are correct, we are no longer under Iceland. Can it be the ocean spread about? Of course. I do not feel so easy at the thought of the boundless ocean rolling over my head. Whether it be plains or mountains, it matters little, as long as we are arched over by solid granite. Four days later, in the evening, we arrived at a vast kind of grotto. One, in, two... And it was there at six o'clock, Hans was paid his weekly salary as agreed. Three rix dollars. Three. And it was settled the next day should be a day of rest, where I awoke relieved from the preoccupation of an immediate start. Although we were in the very deepest of known depths, there was something not unpleasant about it. I'm beginning to become accustomed to this troglodyte life. Well, that is something, Axel. We do have flesh more, Kyle, Professor. Nay, no. take hands, no more biscuit. I no longer think of the sun, moon or stars, trees, houses and towns, nor any of those terrestrial excesses which are necessary to men who live upon the Earth's surface. Oh, perhaps that comes from being at a depth of 16 leagues. But that is the very limit assigned by science to the thickness of the crust of the Earth. At the latitude of Iceland, where we are now, the radius of the Earth, the distance from the center to its surface is, in round numbers, 1,600 leagues. Now, 16 leagues are the hundredth part of the Earth's radius. It has taken us 20 days to get as far as we now have. Therefore, at this rate, we shall be 2,000 days, or nearly five and a half years, in getting to the center. What one man has done, another may do. And it will certainly not take five and a half years. I hope so. But still, if I may be permitted... You shall have my leave to hold your tongue, Axel. But not to talk in that irrational way. As you wish, Uncle Liedenbrook. All in all, it must be confessed that hitherto things had not gone so badly, and that I had small reason to complain. And to what height of scientific glory we should then attain? I had become quite a Liedenbrook in my reasonings. Seriously, I had. For several days, steeper inclines, some even frightfully near to the perpendicular, brought us deeper and deeper into the mass of the interior of the earth. Also, pass poor, Professor. The can't wake too fast. Your footing, not there, Uncle. To the left, there's a rock. Try yeah. that. Ah, yes, sir. It, it, it seems quite secure, and I... Oh! 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 It's all right. I'm safe. Safe. Oh. By August the 7th, the tunnel went down a gentle slope. I was ahead of the others with the Rumkoff's apparatus. The beds of granite are remarkable here, Uncle. You see here, the grain is quite large. I would say larger than before, and the colour... Uncle? 
Uncle. Hans. But where are you, Uncle? Have you stopped? Hans! I must have been going too fast. Stay where you are. I'll come back to you. Uncle Liedenbrook? Hans! Where are they? There's only one road, and they're on it. I, I, I'm coming! <laughs> Uncle Liedenbrook? Hans! I'll be with you soon. Have I not a guarantee that I shall not lose my way? A clue in the labyrinth. One that will lead me back to you, my faithful stream, hands back. The stream is gone. It's no longer at my feet. Uncle Liedenbrook! Uncle Liedenbrook! In Journey to the Center of the Earth, adapted from the Jules Verne novel by Moya O'Shea, Axel was played by Joel McCormack, Professor Liedenbrook by Stephen Critchlow, Hans Gudmundur Thorvaldsen, Groiben Nicola Ferguson, and Martha Elizabeth Bennett. Other parts were played by Nick Underwood, Sam Ricks, Tom Forrester, and Scarlett Brooks. Original music was composed by Neil Brand, and the director was Tracy Neal. <laughs> to the ends of the Earth. Journey to the center of the Earth. Adapted from the Jules Verne novel by Moya O'Shea. Episode two. years from now. Uncle Liedenbrook! Hans, where are you? To describe my despair would be impossible, but one word described my position. Lost! I am lost! I will tell you this now. I was buried alive. The 30 leagues of rock above seemed to weigh upon my shoulders with a dreadful pressure. Should I go up or down? Up, of course. Continually. I must find the stream. With the stream at my feet, I might hope to regain the summit of Snyfor. How had I become separated from my uncle Liedenbrook and Hans, our guide? I was ahead. Perhaps they thought I was behind. How had I left the course of the stream at the Hans back, which had gone with my companions away into unknown depth? I must get out. I must find my way to... The ramp! No! No! Don't go out. No, no. Don't leave me in this darkness, please. Stay. Don't die. Don't... Dear God, no! The last glimmer. I drank it in as if I could preserve it. The last sensation of light my eyes were ever to experience. I must get out of here. Oh, my darling Groiben, what have I done? What if I never see you again? Groiben, no! No! Help! Help! Uncle Liedenbrook! Hands! I'm here! I'm here! Axel. 
Kruipen. Kruipen. Take it wrong, sir. That sound. A delusion? That way, I think. Who is that? Someone speaking. Help! Uh, help! Oh, it must be them. Help! But how can I hear them? A, a trick of the mind? Ah, the noise comes along the tunnel. Oh, uh, yes! Yes! My boy, where are you? Lost in the deepest darkness. What about yourself? It is out! And the trees are being hand Disappeared! That is the sound I heard. We must know how far we are apart. Y you have your chronometer? I have. Well, take it and call my name, noting the exact second you speak. I will repeat it as soon as it comes to me, and you will observe the exact moment when you get my answer. Just so, Uncle! Ready now? I am going to call oh. your name! <laughs> Axel! Axel! My uncle calculated I was at a distance some four and a quarter miles away from a vast chamber where he now stood with hands. Must I go up or down? Down! Your tunnel must lead into this chamber! <laughs> Get up and begin walking. Drag yourself if necessary. Slide down the steep places, and at the end, you will find us ready to welcome you. I'm on my way! You may be wondering how it is my uncle and I were able to converse. This acoustic effect is easily explained on scientific grounds. It arose from the concave form of the tunnel and the conducting power of the rock. If you've been in the gallery of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, you will know a similar phenomenon has been observed. The slope was rapid, and I slid down. Soon the swiftness of the descent increased horribly, and I was forced to run. Help! I... Stop! I... I... I felt myself revolving in the air striking and rebounding against the craggy projections of a vertical tunnel. Gruber? Gruber. Hans, he lives. He, he lives, huh? That is true. I'm still alive. Uh, Uncle, where, where is Gruber? Uh, above the ground, back home in Hamburg. Oh. Oh, yes. My dear nephew, uh, you are saved. Uh, <laughs> I, I keep the blanket close to you. No, no, no. no. Good day, Axel. Hello, Hans. And, and now, Uncle, tell me where we are. Uh, tomorrow, Axel. Uh, now, I've bandaged your head with compressors, which must not be disturbed. Asleep now, and tomorrow I will tell you all. But do tell me what time it is and, and what day. Uh, it is Sunday, the 9th of August, and it is 10 at night. You must ask no more questions until the 10th of the month. Hmm? <laughs> Next morning, on awakening, I looked around me. My bed, made up of our travelling gear, was in a charming grotto made up of splendid stalactites. 
Good morning, Axel. I feel sure you're better. Yeah, Axel of Warren. <laughs> Good day. It was a half light. There was no torch or lamp, save for the glow of the campfire. Better? The fever has left you. And no broken limbs? Certainly. And my head? Your head, except for a few bruises, is all right. And it is on your shoulders where it ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> and a score knocker comes, sir? Yeah, 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 two one. Uh, I need good help with it, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid my brain is affected, or are we again on the surface of the globe? But don't I see the light of day, and, and don't I hear the wind blowing and the sea breaking on the shore? Certainly not. Now come and see for yourself, but go gently, my nephew. A relapse might get us into trouble, and we have no time to lose. For well, the voyage may be a long one. The voyage? Here, here, Axel, come. Oh, here. Oh. Take Hans's arm. Oh. Take Hans. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh. Such light, I'm not used to it. What, what, what is... Sea? Uh, the, uh... Leadenbrook Sea. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I don't suppose any other discoverer will ever dispute my claim to name it after myself as its first discoverer. Leadenbrook Hair. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Spray. I can feel the spray on my face. Hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an ocean, isn't it, Axel, with the irregular shores of earth, capes, promontories, worn away by the ceaseless action of the surf. It is frightfully wild in appearance. We were, in reality, shut up inside an immeasurable excavation. Its width could not be estimated, since the shore ran widening as far as the eye could reach. Nor could its length, for the dim horizon bounded the new. As for its height, it must have been several leagues. But the light! It is not the light of the sun! I believe it to be electric in origin, like the aurora borealis. Above? See? Uh, that cloud must be at least 12,000 feet. A far greater height than that of any terrestrial vapor. The word cavern does not convey any idea of this immense space. Uh, do you feel strong enough to walk a little way now, my boy? Uh, certainly. And nothing could be more delightful. Hans, have you got into? Yeah, got so. Take my arm, Axel. Uh, and let us head inland. Uh, uh. Uncle, look. Uh, do you see that? Oh. At the turn of that high promontory. A type of tree, do you think? Sort of the shape, more like a... <laughs> it's only a, a forest of giant mushrooms. <laughs> You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that the Lycopertin giganteum attains a circumference of eight or nine feet, but these must be 30 to 40 feet high. Uh, look, look over there, Hansel. Lowly shrubs of the earth, but here, of gigantic size. The entire floor of the second period of the world, the transition period. Never had a botanist such a feast as this. <laughs> look at the dust under your feet. You see the bones scattered on the ground. So there are. Our bones of extinct animals. Oh, oh. Here is the lower jaw of a mastodon. And, and, and these are, are the molar teeth of the Dinotherium. Ah, this femur must have belonged to the greatest of those beasts, the Megatherium. Uncle, where would you say we are? Uh, here, on the map. Have a look for yourself. The highlands of Scotland are over our heads, mm -hmm. and the Grampians are raising their rugged summits above us. <laughs> it is rather a heavy weight to bear, but a solid arch spans over our heads. But how are we to get down below this liquid surface? Well, if all oceans are, in reality, only lakes, since they are surrounded by land, then this internal sea will be surrounded by a coast of granite, and on the opposite shore we shall find fresh passages opening. We shall set sail tomorrow. Set sail, shall we? Mm -hmm. I should like to see a boat first. And how long do you suppose this sea to be? Well, 30 or 40 leagues. And it would not be a boat at all, but a good, well-made raft. A raft would be just as hard to make as a boat, and I don't see anybody... I know you don't see, but you might hear if you would listen. Don't you hear the hammer at work? Hans is already busy. What? 
He has been felling the trees. Oh, the trees are already down. Come and you will see for yourself, beyond the promontory. Huh. Hey, Hans. Uh, uh, do God in God's stoker are baby. Uh, yeah, tack, tack. Uh, uh, a raft. Hans is making a raft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you first, my warden to go. Uh, <laughs> Hans is pleased with how it's coming along. By the next day, thanks to the industry and skill of our guide, the raft was made. A mast was fashioned from two poles spliced together, a yard was made of a third, and a blanket borrowed from our coverings made a tolerable sail. That's it. Cast off. Dusselter's Absterhands. Yeah. Oh, so. Hans had fitted up a rudder to steer the vessel and took the tiller. Sail works well. Mm. Wind's caught it. I'll be a flaze again. This fine harbour which has given us such kind shelter must have a name. Ah, Port Axel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a better one to propose. Groiben. Let it be called Port Groiben. It will look very well upon the map. Port Groiben it is. So named August the 13th, 1863. And with that, the cherished remembrance of my Vierland days became associated with our adventurous expedition. The wind was from the northwest. We went with it at high speed. At this rate, we shall make 30 leagues in 24 hours, and we shall soon sight the opposite shore. Quickly, we entirely lost sight of land, and Professor Liedenbrook entrusted me to keep a log of our sea trip. Axel, you are to register every observation, make entries of interesting phenomena, the direction of the wind, the rate of sailing, the distance accomplished. In a word, every particular of our singular voyage. And here are my daily notes exactly as I wrote them. Friday, 14th of August. Wind steady, northwest. The raft makes rapid progress in a direct line. Nothing in sight before us. Intensity of light the same? Uh, yes, can walk fish. Ah, Hans is going to try fishing. <laughs> at noon, Hans prepares a hook at the end of the line and baits it with a small piece of meat. For two hours, nothing is caught. Are these waters bare of inhabitants? Can it be that well, we... Oh, something tugged at the fishing line. Yes, I saw it. A sturgeon! A small sturgeon! He may say then, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's a good. See here, the, the, the head is, is flat, but rounded in front. Hmm? Uh, and the anterior part of its body is, is plated with bony, angular scales. It has no teeth, its pectoral fins are large, and it has no tail. Uh, and that this fish belongs to an extinct family of which only fossil traces are found in the Devonian formations. What? Have we taken alive an inhabitant of the seas of the primitive ages? <laughs> it is so, Axel. Uh, but this one displays a peculiarity confined to all fishes that inhabit subterranean waters. It is blind. And uh, not only blind, but actually has no eyes at all. Well, nothing could be more certain. But supposing it might be a solitary case? Hans, please yeah. bait the hook. Oh, Hans, uh, can do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going off, it's good. Within a couple of hours, we have taken more fish. This unhoped-for catch replenishing our stock of provisions. Saturday, 15th of August. The sea remains unbroken all round. No land in sight. The horizon seems extremely distant. One, two, three, uh, and uh, and dot three rich dollars. Here, and two uh, tack. Yeah, my attack. You seem anxious, Uncle. Anxious? No, not at all. Impatient, then. We are going very far. What does that signify? I'm not complaining the rate is slow, but the sea is so wide. We've travelled 30 leagues more than three times now. We're not descending as we ought to be. But since we have followed the road, that Sarkness has shown us... And that us. is the question. Have we followed that road? Did Sarkness meet this sheet of water? Did he cross it? You're really not the best of travellers, are you, Uncle? Sunday, 16th of August. Nothing new. Weather unchanged, so is the light. Truly, this sea is of infinite width. It must be as wide as the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. And why not? My uncle has taken soundings several times. He ties the heaviest of our pickaxes to a long rope, which he lets down to 200 fathoms. No bottom yet. 
He tries again. Tuesday, 18th of August. Evening comes. Or rather, the time comes when sleep weighs down the weary eyelids. For there is no night here, and the ceaseless light tires the eyes with its persistency as if sailing under the Arctic sun. Hans is at the helm. During his watch, my uncle and I sleep. The monsters has a, a, a porpoise's snout, a, a, is its head, <laughs> a crocodile's teeth and heads are mistake. I, I believe it is the ichthyosaurus, the uh, fish lizard, the most terrible of the ancient monsters of the deep. Not the news I wanted to hear. Uh, and, and the other? Uh, the other is a <laughs> plesiosaurus, a, a serpent with a carapace and paddles of a turtle. Uh, he is the dreadful enemy of the uh, other. Oh! Oh! oh. It has torn open the serpent's neck. Oh, oh, the oh, no, I didn't really have to do that. Uh, oh, oh, uh, it was let go at last. Oh. Uh. And do Yes, the, uh, the serpent is dead, Hans. But where did the other one go? What if it comes back? Oh. 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 Wednesday, 19th of August. Fortunately, the wind blows violently, and this enables us to flee from the scene of the late terrible struggle. 
Some hours later, we encounter a curious sight. Oh! oh is it another sea beast? Uh, a sort of vast inverted cone. Oh, please don't get too close. Hey. In Holm, an island. And that's not an island. There's nothing else. But that column of water? Daisy. A geyser on the uh, Axel Island. Axel Island? Yes. <laughs> Axel Island. <laughs> the next few days are strangely calm. The calm before the storm. The air crackling with electricity. On the mast, I can already see the light play of a lambent St. Elmo's fire. Let us reef the sail and cut the mast down to stem our progress. That will be the safest. Never! Then the wind catches him, it will! What I want is to get the least glimpse of rock or shore, even if our raft should be smashed into shivers. Uncle! Uh, uh, Here the notes of my log became vague and indistinct. I've only been able to find a few which I seem to have jotted down unconsciously. Sunday, 23rd of August. Where are we? We are driven forward at a rate beyond all measurement. The lightning flashes with intense brilliancy and never seems to cease for a moment. Oh, 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 the lightning is striking the top of the cavern. What if the roots had crumbled down upon us? We think things cannot get any worse, but within hours, the storm redoubles. Spread out the best! Hold fast! I'll tie down the supplies! You get the instruments! Then tie yourself! To the mast! Yeah, to mast, then! Uh, yeah. uh, 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 untied! Uh, 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 uh. For three days we cling to our raft. Ceaseless fiery arrows darting amongst the flying thunderclouds. My uncle draws near to me. Uh, we are lost! We are lost! Let us lower the sail. I will do it, Uncle. Uh, 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 and I pass more, Axel! Uh, pass more! Pass uh, uh, The fireball! Uh, 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 Let it get us! Mast, then! Uh, the mast! It's gone! Uh, I was nearly gone! Uh, 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 we lay there our blood running cold with unspeakable terror. A fireball, half of it white, half azure blue and the size of a ten-inch shell, moved slowly about the raft, revolving on its own axis with astonishing velocity. Oh, 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 uh, oh! Missed! Uh, uh, I, I can't move my foot! Uh, Axel! Is it riveted to the planks? See, uh, I'm stuck! Walking uh, uh, instrumental! Uh, uh, the fireball must have uh, magnetized every iron particle on board. The, 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 the guns, instruments, tools. We're all being drawn to one another. Uh, uh, the nails of my boots are magnetized uh, to a plate of iron let into the timbers. Uh, uh, and I've got to get free. I've uh, 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 done it. Uh, it is burst in flame. Uh, fire. The fireball bursts, throwing tongues of fire around the raft. But as quickly as they came, they disappear. And I can just see my uncle at full length on the raft, and hands still at his helm. But where are we going? Where? Tuesday, 25th of August. The storm continues to roar and rage, and we are borne along at an incalculable speed. What is it, Hans? Look! Look! That noise! I hear something! Yeah. Uh, can it be? Whoa! I can't swim! Oh, 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 oh,
Here I end the log after being happily saved from the wreck by the brave Icelander, when the raft was dashed upon the rocks, and I resume my tale as before. We have got there. To our journey's end. To the end of that endless sea. Now we shall go by land and really begin to descend, descend, descend. But my dear uncle, have you ever thought about how we are to get back to Hamburg and home to Groiben? When we have reached the centre of the globe, either we shall find some new way back or we shall come back like decent folk the way we came. We have enough provisions to last. Biscuits, salt meat, spirits and salt fish. We might reckon on four months' supply. But the guns were lost, and we cannot hunt. But hunt what? We still have powder. And the instruments? We have the manometer, the most useful of all. By means of it, I can calculate the depth and know when we have reached the center. And we might very likely go beyond and come out of the Antipodes. But what about the compass? Here it is, in perfect condition, as well as the thermometers and the chronometer. Where do you think we could be? Now, let us consult the compass here. Now, let's see. Uh, hmm. Oh, what's the matter? I'll take a look. Oh. Well, the north pole of the needle has turned to what is supposed to be the south. Hmm. Uh, it is pointing to the shore instead of the open sea. But look, it, it, in whatever position I place it, the needle pertinaciously returns to this unexpected quarter. Axel, did the wind change and we did not notice? Uh, it must be so. Otherwise, how can it be that we're back on the shore? We thought we'd left so far behind us. We've gone backwards instead of forwards. Oh! Oh. How shall I describe the strange series of passions which shook the breast of Professor Liedenbrook? First, stupefaction, then incredulity, lastly, a downright burst of rage until... Oh, will fate play tricks upon me? Will the elements plot against me? I, I, I will not yield. I will get hands to repair the raft, and tomorrow we will set sail. Uncle, no. And since fate has driven me onto this part of the coast, I will not leave it until I have examined it. Then let us start upon fresh discoveries. After leaving Hans to his work, we started off together, trampling over numberless shells of all the forms and sizes which existed in the earlier stages of the world. Uncle, this carapace must be all of 15 feet in diameter. By the covering of a gigantic glyptodon or armadillo of the Pliocene period, of which the modern tortoise is but a miniature representative, dear boy. We traversed the shores of the Liedenbrook Sea for a mile, when we observed a sudden change of appearance in the landscape, where a field, nay, more than a field, a vast plain of bleached bones of animal life through the ages appeared spread before us. All sorts of extinct monsters assembled together for your satisfaction, Uncle Liedenbrook. <laughs> And here, see, the, the, this must be a... Axel, Axel. A human body. A human body? Over there. Oh, why, why, so it is. Is there some particular soil like that in the cemetery of St. Michel in Bordeaux, which has preserved it like this for so many years? The skin is like parchment. <laughs> the limbs still have their shape, sound teeth, abundant hair, and fingernails and toenails of frightful length. Oh, <laughs> How I shall enjoy sharing this with my students of the Uenea! <laughs> oh, uncle! <laughs> Another remarkable thing. This fossil body was not the only one in this immense catacomb. We came upon bodies at every step amongst this mortal dust. In fact, it was a wonderful spectacle. These generations of men and animals co-mingled in a common cemetery. I wonder if all these creatures slid through a great fissure in the crust of the earth down to the shore of the Liedenbrook Sea when they were dead, turning to dust. Or had they lived and grown and died here, in this subterranean world under a false sky, just like the inhabitants of the upper earth, hmm? We pushed on, impelled by our burning curiosity. Axel, a forest. Oh, the trees, well, they have no color. None of them have color. They grow without the life-giving heat and light of the sun. They are of a uniform gray, silver gray, perhaps light Uncle, brown. Stop. My boy, what is it? There. 
to the right, amongst the trees. Something moving. It, it, it looks like it, it can't possibly be mastodon. So it is. Oh, come on! Forward! Forward! I will not! We have no firearms! Oh. Come away, Uncle! Uncle, come! No. no human being may safely brave the anger of these monstrous beasts. No human creature. Oh, you are wrong, Axel. Look, look down there. I fancy I see a living creature similar to ourselves. It is a man. Well, I don't see. It can't be. Is it possible? <gasps> Quick, behind the tree before he sees us. Oh, very well. He must be all of 12 feet high. Oh, his head is huge and unshapely. It puts me in mind of a buffalo's with that unkempt mane of hair. Look, that is his herd, those mastodons. He is watching them. Immanuis pecoris custos Emmanuel Ips. He is a giant, able to control those monsters. A shepherd of the geological period. Oh, no. He spotted us. Oh. oh no, I was wrong. But why must we hide? Do you think he may not relish intruders? My worry is he would relish intruders with a keen appetite. He would eat us. We cannot be sure. I do wonder, though, what he would make of us. Creatures of a similar shape. We are about to find out. What do you mean? Run! Oh, oh, those beasts! Oh. Stampeding them towards us! Quick! Excellent! They're so close, I can smell them! They oh, oh, smell! Oh, 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 oh. Uh, 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 Uncle Help! I'm falling! Grab the fire! I, I think they, they may have halted their car. But I'm not stopping to find out. Axel, wait for me! We kept running and instinctively got back to the Liedenbrook Sea. <sighs> Evidently, we did not land at our original starting point, but the storm has carried us a little higher. And if we follow the shore, we will find the promontory where Hans constructed the raft. What's this? What's half buried in the sand? Uh, a dagger. Did you bring this weapon with you? I? No, certainly. But you, perhaps... I've never had this object in my possession. Well, this is strange. Uh, Axel, it is very simple. The Icelanders often wear arms of this kind. This must have belonged to Hans, and he dropped it. H Hans never had an object like this. Did it not belong to some pre-Adamite warrior? To some living man contemporary with the huge shepherd? No. No, this is not a relic of the Stone Age. It's not even of the Iron Age. This blade is steel and... Axel, this dagger belongs to the 16th century. It, it, it was never yours or mine or the Eiderdown Hunters. Nor did it belong to any of those human beings who may or may not inhabit this inner world. This blade has been left on the sand for up to 300 years and has blunted its edge upon the rocks that fringe the subterranean sea. But it has not come alone. It has not twisted itself out of shape. Uh, Someone has been here before us. A man who has engraved his name somewhere with that dagger. That man wanted once more to mark the way to the center of the earth. Let us look about. Uh, uh, oh. Here, Axel, come and see. On this granite slab, bold as day. Can it be? Two letters. Runic. A. S. Honor Sarknesum. Not only are the initials of the learned alchemist visible on the rock, but here is the iron point with which the letters were engraved. <sighs> Uncle, I can no longer doubt the existence of that wonderful traveler. Honor Sarknesum. Thou marvelous servant. Thou hast not forgotten one indication which might serve to open to mortals the road through the terrestrial crust. I, too, will inscribe my name upon this dark granite page beside the tunnel leading to our conquest. And from now on, let this cape that advances into the sea, discovered by yourself, 
be known by your own illustrious name. Cape Solomonus. Uncle, blessings on that storm. It has brought us back to this coast from which fine weather would have carried us away. We should never have seen the name of Sarknesum. Yes, Axel, it is providential that whilst supposing we were steering south, we should have actually gone back north to Cape Sarknesum. I, I must say that this is a, it's astonishing, and I, I feel I have no way to explain it. Well, what does it matter, Uncle? Our business is not to explain facts, but to use them. Well, certainly. We are but... going now to resume the northern route and to pass under Sweden, Russia, mm. Siberia, uh, who knows where, instead of burrowing under the deserts of Africa. You are right. Now we go down, down, down. Do you know, it is now only 1,500 leagues to the center of the globe. Is that all? Why, that's nothing. Let us start. March. Now, wait! We must get the raft, our things, and hands. Oh, yes. And then we march. The soul of the professor had passed into me. The genius of discovery possessed me wholly. Axel, can you wear any tar ebene or bin a ton of flowing fast? Uh, Axel, he wants you to jump onto those rocks there and secure the raft. I uh, will do. Back. Nice and tight. I was wondering if we shouldn't burn the raft. We're not going to need it anymore. It would prevent the temptation to return to the surface. Keep us on our path. Certainly not. Nothing can stop us now. At least don't let us lose a minute. Yes, yes, but first let's examine this new tunnel to see if we should require our ladders. Our hands, have you checked it out? Yeah, got so. We more hell out a lamp in there. Go ahead, eh? Axel, the Romkov's apparatus here. You take it and lead the way. An honor, uncle. The mouth of the tunnel was not more than 20 yards from us, and our party, with myself at the head, made for it without a moment's delay. The beginning of the next stage of our journey to the center... What? Oh, cursed rock. Hey, nay, nay, why in a spell? Oh, the way is blocked. A giant piece of rock is blocking our way. But how was it with Sarkness? Indeed? Was he stopped by this stone barrier? Uh, it seems this fragment of rock may have been shaken down by some shock or convulsion since he passed this way. Well, then let us make our way with the uh, pickaxes, spades. Mm, it's too hard for the pickaxe. I know. We'll blow it up. Blow it up? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good idea, action. And so it would be. The Icelander retrieved an iron bar from the raft, which he used to bore a hole for the charge. This was no easy task. Whilst Hans was at work, I was actively helping my uncle to prepare a slow fuse of wetted gunpowder encased in linen. I beg you, uncle, please let me light the fuse. Yeah, take care, my boy. Once you've lit it, then hurry and join us back on the raft, and we will push off to avoid the dangers arising from the explosion, the effects of which are not likely to be confined to the rock itself. Take the torch. Thanks, uncle. Hell uluke. A Godspeed, my boy. I'm here. Ready? We are. Put the torch to the fuse, Axel. With pleasure, Uncle. It's a light. Run! Run quickly! Yeah, run! 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 Soon the raft was 20 fathoms out to sea. It was a moment of intense exhilaration. Down, rock. Down with you. But here be mine. What's happened? I should have gone off by now. I will go and see what's going on. Yeah, 
The ground has opened up. Annecy has been, been sucked into it. And us along with it. Hold on, Axel. Hands. Hold on. The sea, lashed into a sudden fury, rose up in an enormous billow on the ridge of which the unhappy raft was uplifted bodily into the air with all its crew and cargo. And in less than a second, we were in a deep, unfathomable darkness. I then understood what had taken place. On the other side of the blown-up rock was an abyss. This is no doubt the same road that Sarkness has taken, but instead of walking peaceably down it as he has done, we are carrying a whole sea along with it! Let's take it all! Let's get Paul and Ken I see something! Oh, uh, Flicker! Uh, uh, Hans is riding the room! Oh, oh yes! Yeah. Uh, Sorry! Uh, oh, look at this here! Uh, good night! Uh, Thank goodness! Uh, Good fellow hands. Uh, I'll check what is left uh, of the cargo. Uh, 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 the instruments are gone, save for uh, the compass and the uh, chronometer. Uh, Ropes and ladders are gone. Uh, uh, only this piece of cord remains of what is left of the mast. Uh, oh, no! Oh, no, 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 no! Now the lantern is going out! Uh, 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 and perhaps the water uh, got in! Uh, Black night reigned again, and there was no hope of being able to dissipate the palpable darkness. After a considerable lapse of time, our speed redoubled. I could perceive it by the sharpness of the currents that blew past my face. I believed we were no longer sliding, but falling. My uncle's hand and the vigorous arm of hands held me fast. Why are we still falling? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, but, uh, but uh, now we're, we're rising. Yeah, I feel it too, uh, as if we're on some sort of water spout. Uh, the, the water has reached the bottom of the gulf. It is now rising to its level and taking ours with it. What if this well has no opening at the top? Uh, we'll be crushed. Uh, uh, it's also uh, becoming very hot. Uh, I'm thirsty. Uh, I'm string. Uh, 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 the water beneath is scalding. Uh, We're rising to a fiery furnace. Impossible. No, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if what? it was... What? Uh, I feel a catastrophe approaching. Uh, uh, An earthquake. Uh, oh! Uh, oh! Uh, yeah. uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, hands light. Look above, my boy. Glimmers of light here and there. Not an earthquake, Axel. Something better. We are running up the shaft of a volcano. <laughs> We are being taken up in an eruption. How can that be better? I don't see any other way of reaching the surface of the Earth. The surface? We started uh, in Snifle, an extinct volcano, uh, uh, and now we're inside one full of activity uh, in, uh, in what uh, part of the world? Uh, uh, oh, this dreadful heat. Uh, uh, oh, I wish I could have some water, but it's too hot. There is no more water, Axel. Only a lava paste, which is bearing us up on the surface to the top of the crater. The crater. <laughs> <laughs> It's sulfurous vapors, which uh, one might expect in an eruption. They are quite natural. Uh, uh, and fire! Uh, and down uh, those tunnels, see? The walls are quaking. Uh, the rocks are shivering. Uh, it appears we are not in the main shaft of the volcano, but a lateral gallery. Uh, 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 Stop her. Uh, we've we've, we've stopped. We're not moving. Yes. Uh, Stop her. Uh, uh, has the eruption ceased? I hope not. I should think it will. Hold on, Axel! Hands! Uncle Lindenberg! You may be surprised to hear this, but I have no exact recollection of what took place at that moment. I have a confused impression left of continuous explosions, loud detonations, a general shaking of the rocks all around us, and of a spinning movement with which our raft was at once whirled helplessly in circles.
Professor. Professor. Ah. Ah. Axel. Ah. Ah. Oh, my eyes. Ah. A light. Where are we? Is it Iceland? Nice. Oh, this sun, I can't see. It's blinding. Uh, what? No, 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 Dick, Iceland. Uh, not Iceland. No. Uh, hands must be mistaken. I must see. Oh. Uh. Open your eyes, Axel. Uh. This is no northern volcano. There are no granite peaks capped with snow. Look, down there. Below the lava. Oh, it's a dream. A, a, a perfect bower of, of rich green. See. See, my host. See. There's a little Havneby, a little landsby. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can God see it. Uh, Axel, over there, a, a small seaport or village. Oh, so there is. This spectacle is welcome to eyes long used to underground darkness. Oh. Oh! Uh, uh, uh. Hey, come, oh. sir. Oh. Uh, Be careful, Farley. Uh, uh, Hans is right. We, we must get away. The explosions are going on still. And I don't think it would look well to have come out by an eruption and then that our heads get broken by bits of falling rock. Let us get down. Oh, good idea. Uh, come, Hans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 we must be in Asia, on the coast of India, in the Malay Islands or in Oceania. Pass through half the globe and come out nearly at the antipodes of Europe. But the compass, sir. We slid down screes of ashes, carefully avoiding the lava streams which glided sluggishly by us like fiery serpents, until happily, after two hours of walking, a charming country lay open to us, covered with olive trees, pomegranate trees, and delicious vines. Grapes. I must have some. Oh, mm. oh so delicious. Mm. Mm. Oh, mm. The inexpressible pleasure of pressing these cool, sweet fruits oh. to my lips. Mm. Mm. Oh. Oh, look, there is a son of this happy land. Huh? Boy! Boy! Mm. Uh, he's running off. You're asking off for fat, Paul Ham. Hey! Oh. Hey, Arm. Oh. Uh, God, go, Hans. Uh, a boy, uh, what is this mountain called? <laughs> ah, very well, I infer that we're not in Germany. Amiquito, como se llama esta montana? Uh, try French. Uh, mon ami, quel est le nom du said montagna? <laughs> now, let us try Italian. Uh, dove nos siamo? Stromboli. Stromboli? <laughs> Stromboli! Oh, we were hardly thinking of that! Stromboli! 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 We're in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, on an island of the Aeolian Archipelago. What a journey we have accomplished! How marvellous! Having entered by one volcano, we have issued out of another more than 2,000 miles from Stifel, and away from that barren, faraway Iceland. But the compass, it pointed due north! How are we to explain the fact? My opinion is that it's best not to explain it. We left the Grove of Olives and arrived at the little port of San Vincenzo, where Hans claimed his 13th week's wages. One, two, three. Ah, oh, en, to, tre. Here, Hans, and uh, a mango tag. Um, thank you, <laughs> Professor Liedenbrock. Uh, Hans, we can't thank you enough for all you've done for us. Huh? Um, uh, Tuzentak. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, so having to you. <laughs> Hans says it has been a very interesting adventure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's have you to after. And then, on the evening of the 9th of September, we arrived back in Hamburg. Uh, You're back! Both of you safe! We are indeed, Groyben, and we can't wait to tell you of our adventure. Groyben. Oh, Axel! Oh, Axel! You must have worried so, my love. About what? About me. Not really. Perhaps a little concern. Not at all. Groyben. Oh, Axel! I never doubted you would return to me. Never, never. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am to hear that. 
And now you are a hero, you will not leave me again. Oh, no. My pretty feeling days, I will not. <laughs> How can I describe the extraordinary sensation produced by the return of Professor Liedenbrook? My uncle was a great man, and I was now the nephew of a great man, which is not a privilege to be despised. And Hans, whether he knew it or not, was a great man too. I often thought of our faithful Eiderdown hunter back home in Iceland, who will never be forgotten by those he protected, and I certainly shall not fail to see him once more before I die. To conclude, I have to add that this journey to the center of the earth created a wonderful sensation in the world and was printed and translated into all civilized languages. But there was one dead fly amidst all this glory and honor. One fact, one incident of the journey that remained a mystery. And then one day... Uncle! Uncle! Axel, what Uncle, see the compass? Its poles are reversed. Reversed? I had only just noticed they point the wrong way. Uh, of course. After our arrival at Cape Sarknesum, the north pole of the needle of this confounded compass began to point south instead of north. Uh, evidently. The here, then, is the explanation for our mistake. But what phenomenon could have caused the reversal of the pole? Uh, the reason is clear, Uncle. During the electric storm on the Liedenbrook Sea, that ball of fire which magnetized all the iron on board reversed the poles of our compass. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it was, it was just an electric joke? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> From that day forth, you must know the professor was the most glorious of savants, and I was the happiest of men. For my pretty Vielandes, resigning her place as ward, took her position in the old house on the Königstrasse in the double capacity of niece and wife. What is the need of adding her godfather was the illustrious Otto Liedenbrook, corresponding member of all the scientific, geographical, and mineralogical societies of the civilized world, and venturer to the center of the earth. In Journey to the Center of the Earth, adapted from the Jules Verne novel by Moya O'Shea, Axel was played by Joel McCormack, Professor Liedenbrook by Stephen Critchlow, Hans Goodmundor Thorvaldsen, and Groiben by Nicola Ferguson. Original music was composed by Neil Brand, and the director was Tracy Neal. <laughs>